mitral regurgitation is incompetence of the mitral valve mitral valve is present between left atrium and left ventricle and this mitral valve should close at the end of the diastole so that when the systole is happening that is when left ventricle is contracting this mitral valve is closed and there should be movement of blood from left ventricle to aorta so if this mitral valve is incompetent then it will not be able to close properly such that when left ventricle will contract blood will move into the aorta as well as back into the left atrium so there is a regurgitation of blood from left ventricle to left atrium and that's what we call as mitral regurgitation so what can be the causes of this mitral regurgitation first of all to understand that we need to understand the mitral valve apparatus because problem anywhere in this apparatus can lead to mitral regurgitation so this mitral valve apparatus is not only the leaflets of the mitral valve mitral valve apparatus consists of two leaflets which oppose with each other so these uh, actually close there is opposition of the leaflets when the mitral valve closes so there are two leaflets that is why mitral valve is known as a bicuspid valve then there is a annulus a ring that supports the leaflets then there is chordate tendony these are cords which extend from the annulus to the papillary muscles this is papillary muscles to which these chordate tendony are attached and then there is adjacent myocardium also which is part of this uh, mitral valve apparatus because if this is abnormal then obviously papillary muscle will not be able to hold this chordate tendony so there are five components of mitral valve apparatus the leaflets the annulus chordate tendony papillary muscle and the adjacent myocardium and problem anywhere in this apparatus can lead to mitral regurgitation now this mitral regurgitation can either be acute mitral regurgitation or there can be causes which have caused the degeneration long term degeneration of the mitral valve apparatus and that leads to chronic mitral regurgitation when we talk about acute mitral regurgitation then acute myocardial infarction is one of the most common cause of acute mitral regurgitation because in acute myocardial infarction there can be rupture of these papillary muscles so immediately that mitral regurgitation will start and we will see how acute mitral regurgitation is different from chronic mitral regurgitation so that is acute myocardial infarction and second cause of acute regurgitation is acute rheumatic heart fever okay so that is acute cause in chronic rheumatic heart disease most commonly we get mitral stenosis but in acute rheumatic heart fever most commonly we get acute myocardial regurgitation however chronic mr can also occur in long standing rheumatic heart disease but not as commonly as mitral stenosis so that is acute mitral regurgitation when we talk about chronic mitral regurgitation causes can be mitral valve prolapse there can be dilated cardiomyopathy in dilated cardiomyopathy what will happen the ventricles will dilate and then because of this dilation there will be stretching of this annulus ring which will stretch along with the myocardium so that the space between these mitral leaflets is going to increase so dilated cardiomyopathy causing the mitral regurgitation then obviously there can be rheumatic heart disease and there are n number of other causes of mitral regurgitation also like infective endocarditis also can cause mitral regurgitation hocm can also cause mitral regurgitation basically when we look into mitral regurgitation there is another way also in which we can divide the causes that is primary mitral regurgitation and secondary mitral regurgitation also known as functional mr in primary mitral regurgitation it is the direct involvement of the leaflets and the chordate tendony of the mitral valve apparatus so when there is degeneration of uh, these parts then it leads to mitral regurgitation which in turn affects the heart okay on the other hand secondary mitral regurgitation these components leaflets and chordate tendony are normal they are not degenerated however due to the involvement of the papillary muscles because of some heart disease 
or the enlargement of the annulus as we saw in dilated cardiomyopathy that there will be mitral regurgitations. So this secondary MR is caused by a heart disease which in turn has led to mitral regurgitation. Primary mitral regurgitation, direct effect of leaflets and cordate tendinae, they might have degenerated which leads to the further heart problems. Secondary mitral regurgitation, already there is some heart disease like dilated cardiomyopathy or HOCM or even myocardial infarction which affects the functioning of the mitral valve. So that is why it is also known as functional mitral regurgitation. Now let us come to pathophysiology of mitral regurgitation. So main problem in uh, mitral regurgitation is as I told you before that during systole blood should flow into the aorta from the left ventricle. However, in mitral regurgitation, it flows into the aorta as well as back into the left atrium. So, there is a regurgitant flow into the left atrium. So, what will be the problems? Now, the problems will depend on whether it is acute myocardial regurgitation or chronic myocardial regurgitation. Let us look at them one by one. So, first is acute myocardial regurgitation. Acute myocardial regurgitation is like it is happening in an instant. There are no compensatory changes which has happened in the heart. So what will happen that as a regurgitation starts, there will be decrease in the forward flow, right? That is the amount of blood going into the aorta is going to decrease. So there is going to be decreased cardiac output, correct? Also, there is going to be increased backward flow which we are calling as increase in the regurgitant volume, regurgitant flow. But this regurgitant flow, what is going to happen that as the regurgitation takes place, there will be increase in the left atrial pressure because left atria is a small, right? So it is accommodating lot of blood. That's why the left atrial pressure is going to increase. It is not that much compliant. And as left atrial pressure increases, pulmonary vessels pressure is also going to increase. Pulmonary pressures is going to increase, which will lead to increase in hydrostatic pressure in the pulmonary capillaries, ultimately causing pulmonary edema. Okay, so this is the main problem in acute myocardial regurgitation, development of pulmonary edema because left atrial pressure increases tremendously. However, you see, one important thing happens here that since left atrium is getting filled with the blood, during diastole, same blood, this regurgitant flow will enter into the left ventricle during the diastole. Okay. And what will happen that uh, there will be increase in the end diastolic volume. So whatever has gone forward into the aorta, that will come by venous return into the left atrium. That will also enter into the left ventricle. And already the blood which has accumulated into the left atrium from the left ventricle, that is also entering into the left ventricle. So there is going to be increased end diastolic volume. This increased end diastolic volume will increase the strength of contraction of the heart. Okay, what is this? This is Frank Stalling law. As end diastolic volume increases, there is increase in the stretching of the cardiac muscle fibers and there is increase in the contractile strength, increase in strength of contraction, which is going to increase the stroke volume. So what we are saying here that despite the regurgitant flow increasing, with increase in the stroke volume, more blood is going into the aorta such that the ejection fraction actually is increasing. Let us see with some numbers here what I am trying to explain. Say suppose in normal condition end systolic volume is 50 ml okay and end diastolic volume is 120 ml that is with normal filling of the heart. So in this case stroke volume is 70 ml okay. When regurgitation starts, beginning of the regurgitation, regurgitation starts, out of this 70 ml, <clears throat> let us divide maybe 30 ml goes into the left atrium and 40 ml goes into the aorta. Okay. So there is backward flow and forward flow. Just remember here that this backward flow is not that much. Why? 
because you see left atrial pressure is increasing in acute mr so it is going to inhibit the backward flow so main problem in acute mr is that even with a small amount of backward flow left atrial pressure increases too much such that pulmonary edema occurs okay back to our uh, numbers here so 30 ml is a left atrial regurgitant volume 40 ml is aorta volume yes forward amount of blood flow has decreased initially but you see next beat what will happen the 70 ml blood which has been ejected in previous beats that will come back as venous return 70 ml plus 30 ml which has gone back that will also return so 100 ml will be the addition of blood into the ventricles so now the end diastolic volume is going to become 50 ml plus 100 ml so end diastolic volume is going to become 150 ml right so that's what i was telling increase in end diastolic volume will increase the strength of contraction and now stroke volume is going to increase it will not be 70 ml it will be 100 ml okay 100 ml and out of this 100 ml some will go into the left atrium and some will go into the aorta such that the total volume which is going into the aorta will be maintained it will no longer be 40 ml it may be 60 ml also so what i am trying to say here is forward flow is maintained because of increase in the end diastolic volume but the main problem in acute mr is increase in left atrial pressure which ultimately leads to pulmonary edema and in fact this development of pulmonary edema in acute mr is a medical emergency and needs to be treated immediately so that was the acute mr pathophysiology coming to chronic mr in chronic mr due to chronic regurgitation of the blood there will be compensatory changes which would happen in the body and what are these compensatory changes you see this chronic regurgitation is happening during the systole okay that is the blood is going into the left atrium so this is going to cause left atrial enlargement right left atria will increase in size this in turn is going to increase the left atrial compliance that is it is going to accommodate more amount of blood without much increase in left atrial pressure left atrial pressure is not going to increase however it can accommodate more amount of blood so regurgitant volume which is there it is going to increase in acute mr we saw that because left atrial pressure is increasing it is going to inhibit the regurgitant volume because pressure gradient is important for flow right so here since there is increase in la compliance la pressure is not going to increase that much so that more amount of blood can enter into the left atrium so that means forward flow is going to decrease okay more amount of blood enters into left atrium so this is going to decrease the forward flow right this was not the case in acute mr so there will be decrease in the cardiac output however since la pressure is not increasing la pressure is not increasing that much that's why pulmonary edema is not going to develop because pulmonary pressures are also not going to increase pulmonary edema is not going to develop so the patient is going to feel better as far as those signs and symptoms are concerned however because of decrease in forward flow decrease in cardiac output he will feel exertional dyspnea and fatigue also decrease in forward flow decrease in cardiac output means decrease in systolic blood pressure so compensatory mechanisms will in start to improve the systolic blood pressure by the baroreflex and there will be tachycardia okay tachycardia will also be there now increase in la enlargement can lead to further problems that is the chances of development of atrial fibrillation are going to increase because as we had discussed in mitral stenosis lecture that whenever there is enlargement of the atria there are chances of developing reentry circuits in left atria so there will be chances of development of atrial fibrillation and once atrial fibrillation develops the person will have palpitations okay palpitations now that was about the left atrium 
Now, the same volume which has gone into the left atrium during the systole will enter into the left ventricle during diastole. So, that means even the left ventricle will have the volume overload. Okay. So, left ventricle volume overload will be there. So, what we are telling here in mitral regurgitation, there is volume overload both in left atrium as well as left ventricle. So, left ventricle volume overload again, there will be compensatory changes and there will be development of left ventricular dilation and left ventricular eccentric hypertrophy eccentric hypertrophy okay so this ultimately will lead to left heart failure left heart failure also you see here left ventricular dilation is occurring and as i have told you before that whenever left ventricular dilation occurs there will be enlargement of the annulus ring of the mitral valve apparatus and if that enlarges, there will be increase in mitral regurgitation. So you see, this is going to further increase the left ventricular volume overload. So there is a positive feedback which develops in case of mitral regurgitation once left ventricle dilates. And why I am telling this is that till a certain amount of time, this chronic MR is compensated. That with certain size of LA and with certain size of left ventricle and because of hypertrophy developing, forward flow will be maintained till a certain time. However, because this process is a positive feedback, ultimately it will land up in left heart failure such that the forward flow decreases. So there is decompensation of this chronic mitral regurgitation. So that was about the pathophysiology of acute mitral regurgitation and chronic mitral regurgitation. Now with this pathophysiology in mind, let's discuss what will be the signs and symptoms in this patient. So in acute MR, what will be the problem? First is uh, what about the pulse? Pulse will be low volume pulse because of decrease in the forward flow. Systolic blood pressure, it will be less. Okay. Because forward flow is less, so we can say the pulse pressure is going to decrease. So that is pulse and blood pressure. Then during inspection and palpation, what will be the findings? See, there is no ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, so we won't get any shifting of the apex. Ventricular hypertrophy occurs only in chronic mitral regurgitation. So we will not see any shifting of the apex. But there will be palpable systolic thrill at the apex. Why? palpable systolic thrill see there is regurgitation of flow through the mitral valve during the systole into the left atrium so this is palpable as systolic thrill and when we auscultate we get other findings which include a soft s1 why soft s1 because mitral valves are not closing properly so there is soft s1 there is a holosystolic murmur, pan-systolic murmur. So you see, if this is S1, okay, and this is S2, S1, S2. So S1 is the closure of the AV valves. S2 is the closure of the semilunar valves, aortic and pulmonary valves. Here what we are seeing is there is regurgitation of blood flow from the ventricles to the atria during the systole. That is the period between S1 and S2. So here we will get a murmur that is pan-systolic murmur. However, in acute MR, this will have a decrescendo pattern. What is this decrescendo pattern? That is, in the beginning, the intensity will be more and it is going to decrease during the systole. Why is it so? This is decrescendo. Why that is happening? Because as I told you that in acute MR, there is increase in left atrial pressure. So this left atrial pressure, as it increases during the systole, it is inhibiting the backward flow, right? So that means the flow, when it is decreasing, the murmur is also going to decrease in intensity as the period of the systole progresses. So that is why in acute MR, we get a pan-systolic murmur with a decrescendo quality. Right? So those are the findings in acute MR and the patient will have signs and symptoms of acute pulmonary edema. So on auscultation, we will also get crackles on the lungs. Okay? So that is one thing, signs of pulmonary edema. Now let's see what will be the findings in chronic MR. In chronic MR, 
the person will have fatigue exertional dyspnea because of low forward cardiac output fatigue exertional dyspnea okay main problem is decrease in forward uh, output right again in compensated stage it will be maintained till a certain extent in decompensated stage it will become extreme what about pulse pulse will be low volume pulse okay decrease in volume then uh, systolic blood pressure again in decompensated stage it will decrease there will be decrease in pulse pressure during inspection and palpation we will feel the apex is shifted laterally shifted laterally by because of left ventricular enlargement then we can feel the systolic thrill at apex because of the backward flow okay systolic thrill what about auscultation auscultation will have same there will be soft s1 okay then again there will be pan systolic murmur pan systolic murmur which we saw in acute mr also however here it will not be of decrescendo pattern why because in this left atrial pressure is not increasing that much so it is not going to inhibit the flow so the configuration of the murmur will be same throughout the systole right so it is a pan systolic murmur which radiates to axilla Uh, same in acute MR also, it will radiate to the axilla. Then, in chronic severe mitral regurgitation, we can have split S two as well. Split S two. Why? Why S two will split? That is because you see the forward flow is less. Forward flow into aorta is less, and backward flow is increasing. So, this aortic uh, component of S two is going to close earlier. aortic valve is going to close earlier compared to the pulmonary valve so that is why they may be splitting of s2 in mitral stenosis we saw that pulmonary valve is closing later than normal right so there is a splitting of s2 there also here we can have aortic valve closing earlier than the pulmonary valve so that can also lead to splitting of s2 and also during diastole there will be presence of s3 because more volume of blood is coming from left atrium to the left ventricle so audible s3 will be there during the diastole so these are the auscultatory findings of chronic mr now this pan systolic murmur what are the condition in which this intensity can increase basically we are telling this murmur is due to the backward flow so any activity which increases the backward flow that is going to increase the intensity of a pan systolic murmur and that happens in case of isometric exercise so if we ask the patient to do hand grip isometric exercise then what is happening that because of isometric exercise the after load is increasing after load increases okay increase in after load will inhibit the forward flow and hence increase the backward flow the resistance of the flow towards the forward side is increasing hence more flow will go into the left atrium thus increasing the intensity of this pan systolic murmur fine so that was about chronic mitral regurgitation so i hope with this you have understood the pathophysiology of acute mitral regurgitation and chronic mitral regurgitation and the associated signs and symptoms thanks for watching the video if you liked it do press the like button share the video with others and don't forget to subscribe to the channel physiology open thank you